May it please the court and counsel. Uh, my name is Corey Lorenzen and I represent the appellant at uh, Alta Vista Properties in this matter. The dispute here and the facts are pretty simple. Um, my client was the successor in interest as a landlord in a lease that was executed in October of 2003 with the options to extend that turned into a 16 year lease through April of uh, uh, 2019. Uh, the original landlord, I for an I LLC uh, transfer, assigned its interest over to my client in June of 2006. Um, at that time, my client uh, purchased the property from I for an I LLC. Uh, the, the tenant throughout has been Mauer Vision Center, and this is uh, for Mauer Vision Center's location up in Waverly, Iowa. Uh, and Dr. Maurer, Dr. Richard Maurer, was, uh, uh, had an ownership interest in both I for an I LLC and Maurer Vision Center at the time that the lease was executed. Uh, the issue arose in this case in May of 2012. Uh, my client was attempting to sell, actually had entered into a contract with a third party to sell the property up in Waverly and contacted representatives of Maurer Vision Center to coordinate access to the property to allow the purchaser to view the property and at that time Maurer Vision Center denied access. Uh, there were a couple additional contacts that were made by my client in, in an effort to try and coordinate uh, uh, access to the building and, and Maurer Vision Center denied access a couple more times. And so that led to the declaratory judgment action being filed by my client in, in this action. My client uh, is looking primarily at two different provisions in um, uh, the lease, it's paragraph 13, which provides that my client has, or the landlord has the right to assign uh, his interest or its interest in the, uh, the property to any third party. In paragraph 19, which states that the landlord has a right to uh, sign, I'm sorry, to mortgage uh, the property. And our position, Alta Vista's position, is that uh, in both of those sections, there is an implied right uh, to, a uh, to access to the building to effectuate the, the terms uh, 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 that are found in paragraph 13 and 19 to allow for the sale or the assignment or to allow for the mortgage. And I, I note um, in, in the previous uh, argument that Justice Apple indicated that uh, prior to the foreclosure, wouldn't the bank go in and inspect the property? And that's, that's kind of the point of, of this argument, which is that any buyer, anybody that my client, the landlord, is going to sell the property to, is going to want to go in and inspect the property. But couldn't you put it in the lease? Well, I think... That, it, that it's going to be there. I mean, um, assignment doesn't mean to a third party. Maybe they're assigning it between corporations that they both control. Maybe they're signing it through a spouse or a child. It doesn't mean every time you assign or mortgage it that it, someone has to come in. And under that circumstance, there would be no need for... Uh, but just entry. because it says you could assign a mortgage doesn't mean every time you assign a mortgage that some has to inspect it before they'll do it. Certainly, you can put it into the contract. You, you can negotiate that and place it into the contract. But the issue here today is whether the terms of this contract, whether it's necessarily implied from the terms of this contract that access should be allowed... For, um, Doesn't the contract say all the terms and conditions are this are included in here and you can't add it? It's an integrated contract. You can't add or imply terms in it. Well, I think... It, it, Doesn't it have an integration clause at the end of it? Well, the, the, the case law um, uh, that, that talks about court uh, in, interpretation uh, it, it discusses the... the facts that need to be taken or the, the different factors that are considered and and among um, the, the first step is to take a look at all of the terms of the contract and decide whether there are different meanings to those terms and and I would propose that this is an, an issue of contract interpretation and as has been stated in several of the cases uh, that have been decided by this court when considering those terms the court can uh, uh, include contractual obligations by implication, not just by the express terms of the contract. Even the bar form that is used for commercial leases has a uh, uh, general provisions as far as assignment and mortgage uh, built into them without the express provision that 
you have to allow a lender to go in and do an inspection or or that the that you have to uh, uh, or the express language that access is granted for an appraisal or for an inspection what about the language that says the tenant gets non-exclusive use does that in your view, also support your position. Well, it does, in my in my opinion, and really, where I think the the district court erred in this case is that the district court only looked at paragraph 12b, um, and paragraph 12b is a provision that states that during the last 90 days, uh, the landlord can uh, place a sign for rent or a sign uh, for sale in the property. And the district court uh, looked at the non-exclusive use language, which is found in paragraph A, and, it's, and the court states may w that provision may well be referring to um, paragraph 12B. And, and just the language may well be to me implies that there are other uh, possible interpretations that, may well, that it may well be um, referring to. So your, but, your view is that 12B is not it says the tenant will permit prospective buyers to enter at that time. It isn't necessarily an exclusive list of when prospective buyers or, uh, or tenants can come on the property. Absolutely. In, in, in my opinion, that Section 12B is conferring a right, but it is not excluding access during uh, different time frames or during the time frame prior to the last 90 days. In fact, I find it interesting that the, the Court of Appeals opinion, while affirming the district court, effectively showed why the district court was wrong um, because the district court's opinion states that access is limited to the final 90 days of the lease but then the court of appeals comes in and says well if you look at at section 9 which contemplates that there's going to be an addition and some renovation the the court of appeals states that that there is a uh, right of access necessarily implied that arises from uh, uh, paragraph 9. And then the Court of Appeals takes a look at Section 14A, which talks about if there's damage to the property that the landlord has a duty to go in and repair that damage. And again, the Court of Appeals says there's a, a uh, right of access which is necessarily implied into um, the lease. But neither the District Court or the Court of Appeals addresses the issue under 13 or 19, which was the very basis of, of the, the lawsuit. Um, ne neither court addresses them. And, and I think that's another reason why the district court's uh, opinion fails to correctly apply the law, because it did not take a look at uh, the lease in its entirety. And Can't you read uh, paragraph 24, and it's more specifically the last sentence in paragraph 24. It's the, inter I call it integration clause. This lease contains the whole agreement of the parties. And if you wanted a right to enter the premise at a different time, because other places say when you can and when you can't, why couldn't you put in the assignment or the mortgage provision that at that, at that time or beforehand you had a right to enter? You did it other places and you agreed to it, but you didn't put it there. And I don't know how you get around the integration clause by well, saying, well, it's assumed, but that's not what the integration clause says. Well, I, and I think in part, Maurer has made that argue, argument, which is that in order to accept our argument that, that, you would, that the judiciary would need to be adding terms to the agreement, and that's never been our argument. We're not stating that we're adding terms. We're simply stating that under the terms of the lease, under paragraph 13, under 19, in order to effectuate that term, that access has to be allowed. In, in order to, uh, to allow an assignment that would include a sale. But not in all circumstances. I mean, I didn't know, no one knew what assignment you were contemplating. I mean, if you wanted the right, doesn't 424 require you to put the right in the contract? Couldn't you make the argument? Oh, go ahead. Uh, okay, and, and can you restate that? I'm sorry. Maybe Justice Mantle's answer. I don't have a question. Okay. Uh, I mean, doesn't that argument cut both ways? I mean, there's nothing expressly in the contract that says they can't go on either. And in fact, paragraph 18 says non-exclusive. So aren't we trying to just figure out what this agreement says? It's right. an interpretation question. Right, right. And, and we have never, 
Maurer has tried to make the, the argument, the straw man argument, that we're seeking unfettered access to the property and I think trying to make us out to be this boogeyman that's going to come in in the middle of the night and create HIPAA violations and, and so on and so forth. And that is not what we're attempting to do. We believe that there are limitations within the lease. The, the limitations include that we can only go in for access under, under nine um, to, to complete the alterations that are contemplated by the parties. Under 13, to effectuate an assignment if necessary. Under 14A, if there's damage, um, that uh, we can go onto the property in order to repair that damage. Uh, under 19, uh, to allow uh, the landlord to place a mortgage on the property, which uh, uh, would include uh, getting an appraisal done or getting a, uh, an inspection done. But if, if you read paragraph 18 where it says non-exclusive, they're not talking about that non-exclusive to the either party can go in. They're talking about that the landlord has the fee simple and the tenant has the term for years and they're, re they're referring to the term to years as a non-exclusive right because it's not a total right. They're not saying that both parties have a right to the place. That's what it, that's what it means when it says a non-exclusive right because it, they say that the landlord has the fee and the tenant has the term of the years. So each one has a non-exclusive right, but it's not talking about who can go in there. Well, I, and, and I'm, I'm not sure I agree because the case law, um, which has both been cited by the Court of Appeals and by Maurer, indicates that a defining characteristic of a lease is that it, it is an exclusive right to possession during the term of the lease and that um, uh, you have to contract around to that. They use the word non-inclusive because it's not exclusive because they don't have the exclusive right to it. They only have the right to possess. They don't have the right to do anything else with it. But then the issue is with, with regard to that right of possession is, is that right of possession during the term of the lease, are they able to exclude the landlord during the term of that lease? And, and th this language under 18, I think with the, the case law, it states that a defining characteristic of a um, lease is that it, it, it does allow f uh, exclusive possession, that this provision is extremely important because this provision is stating that that defining characteristic does not exist in this situation because the parties have specifically contracted and stated that the use is non-exclusive. And then you go back to the remaining terms of the lease, the ones I've already gone through in 9, 13, 14a, uh, et, et cetera, uh, and show that those are all the different areas where uh, non-exclusivity, where the, the uh, landlord um, is allowed access and where the, the tenant uh, does not have uh, the exclusive right to possession. Um, And I, I'm just going to ask a question because I, I just don't know the answer. But, you know, we're talking about a lease that's been in effect for about nine years, I believe, if I'm looking at all the documents correctly. So, so what's been the history of the access to this building by the landlord? Has the landlord never been in this building until from 2003 until 2012, except for now when they are either going to do a sale or assignment, and then Maurer doesn't want to allow them access or... Do, Maybe the record's probably devoid of any type of, you know, historical, you know, practice by these these two parties. But I just have a hard time believing that at no time over the last nine years has the landlord ever had access to this building. Well, it, it brings up a good point. Um, first of all, during the first three years, effectively the landlord and the tenant were the same person because it was Dr. Maurer who had an interest in, in both entities. Um, after 2006, the, the access by my client was, to my knowledge, was uh, pretty limited up until the point in 2012 where they attempted to uh, sell the property. And, and it brings up a good point about what I talked about earlier on the unfettered access. That's not what my client was attempting to do in this situation. In, in fact, my client called and tried to coordinate its access to avoid business disruption and HIPAA violations and those sorts of things that, that have been cited by uh, uh, Maurer in, the, in this case. So I see I'm about out of time. I thank you guys. Thank you as well, Council. Ms. Gutsko. Uh, 
please the court. I'm Diane Kutsko, and I represent Mauer Vision Center, um, in this case, uh, the appellee. And um, uh, here uh, today, um, Alta Vista is basically relying on the issue of whether there is, in fact, an implied, um, implied uh, um, uh, right to come on, on the premises. Um, and it cites uh, uh, the Fashion Fabrics case and also the Taco Bell case. And um, I'd like to say that the fact of the matter is, is that uh, because of, of uh, the fact that a contract is the expression, lease is an expression of the intent in the parties, um, that the court has been very reluctant to imply a right. And um, in this case, uh, the, the, um, it should not be implied. In the Taco Bell case and in the Fashion Fabric case, um, there was a specific need for the implication um, of, uh, of a right, I'm sorry, of a duty of continued occupancy. Um, and, uh, in, and that was necessary uh, to basically, um, because it, it, re it related to the way that rent was paid in that case. And the court found in both of those cases that there was, in fact, such an implied right. There is no reason to imply that kind of a right in this particular case. And um, uh, uh, in addition, the um, Alta Vista relies on the Landlord-Tenant um, Act, the Residential Landlord-Tenant Act, which simply doesn't support this because uh, the Landlord-Tenant Act um, basically uh, refers to residential leases well, and you talked simply about a specific need for access uh, in those two cases and apparently it had to do with uh, the payment of rents is that was that what I understood you to say that's correct isn't there a specific need in this case if you're going to be selling the property and the buyer wants to come in and you're going to have an inspection the buyer may not only have to inspect it himself may also have to have a lending institution come in do an appraisal, there's all sorts of necessities for having access to this building under those circumstances. Yes, and Your Honor, and I think that's an issue of contract interpret lease interpretation as far as what the original parties meant in this particular case. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, um, 12B, um, section 12B talks about the only, um, is, is the only place where the the uh, um, the lease specifies a um, a right of access, and it says within the last 90 days of the um, of the lease, at such time. But okay. but Ms. Kesko, I mean, it's you're right. It's the only thing that talks about at least when prospective tenants or buyers can enter in a, and examine. But it doesn't say this is the only time they can enter. I mean, it isn't unambiguous in the sense I think the Court of Appeals made a bit of an overstatement didn't it I think that 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 provision specifically the, the words at such time basically limit the um, uh, uh, the right to that time and no other but um, it, it says tenant will permit at such time now you're right there's a rule of construction that says and and it supports you it says when there's a list of things you assume that, you, that there aren't other things. That's, that's correct. But there, so there is a rule of construction. On the other hand, it, it isn't exactly a provision that says that's the only time that certainly the landlord can come on the premises. And really what we're talking about is the landlord coming on the premises with other people in tow, right? Well, that's correct. But on the other hand, the question is, is that if you, where's the limitation in that, um, at that point? Well, their argument is that it, it's a reasonable interpretation of 13, 19, 18, and maybe 27, that when you have provisions that allow a sale or a mortgage, in order to effectuate those provisions, you have to, have to be able to have somebody come on the property to look at it. Nobody's going to lend money on a property without an appraisal. And that's, I mean, let me give, it, let me give an example back to you. I mean, what if the provision in the lease said that uh, rent shall be paid to the landlord on or before the first of the month at the landlord's offices? And on uh, a particular day, the, and on the first of the month, the landlord closed their offices and blocked access. 
I mean, you would say certainly that 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 the fact that your your client didn't actually make the rent payment that day doesn't put them in default I mean, because a, an implied condition there is you have to be able to reasonably get access to the landlord's premises to pay them. Well, and Isn't that's this kind of the same thing. Well, no, that's the Taco Bell case or the Fashion Fabrics case where it is so obvious. Um, uh, that that right ought to be implied, otherwise it wouldn't effectuate the intent of the parties. And it also basically, um, it, it basically, it's necessary for, um, to effectuate the intent. I think this is different. And um, I think basically if you go back to principles of interpretation, starting with the one that um, if you have a list, uh, then um, uh, uh, Anything outside the list is not is not um, uh, is not within the contemplation of the parties. The question is is what was in the contemplation of eye for an eye and um, uh, Maurer vision at the time that the I'm sorry that the that the lease was drafted, and you have to look at the 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 um, the face of the contract. I'm sorry, the face of the lease itself, and then this court um, in. Uh, in the Pillsbury case, adopted uh, uh, restatement uh, section 212, uh, comment B, which basically said that um, you have to look at surrounding circumstances. In this case, there is no evidence, and uh, this is we're here on summary judgment. And the fact of the matter is, is that Alta Vista had the opportunity and did su submit extrinsic evidence, the, the evidence of a. Of a um, of uh, a co-owner of I for an I, um, but that that extrinsic evidence simply does not support. Um, uh, I I agree with you. I mean, the, the, you mean the affidavit that yes. says this is what I understood. This is or, what I. And I, it's the, I, I it, agree with you. I okay. agree with you. So we have to look at the whole lease, but we have Correct. to make a reasonable inter decision based on the whole lease of what it what it requires. In yes, this and 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 it's our position that the only reasonable interpretation, because an ambiguity doesn't exist unless there's more than one. Uh, reasonable interpretation. The only reasonable interpretation in this case is that 12B is the exclusive is the exclusive right of access uh, during at the time of sale. And, and if, if I, the, but if you look at the lease in context, I mean, you have, and we're talking about access here. It, it's under signs, and it talks about signs and when you can attach a sign, uh, and then even it's almost as an afterthought. I mean, it's uh, it's. 12 A and B, and it's almost as an afterthought. You say, oh, and oh, by the way, when we put up this for rent and for sale sign, you have to let us have access. That, that's very specific under the sign section, but then when you go to the, the section regarding the non-exclusive occupancy, that to me, just by the context of it, when we're talking about quiet enjoyment and occupancy, that seems to me to be more directly relating to access than a subpart of a section called signs. Well, let me simply say, as uh, 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 counsel for Alta Vista did, refer to the bar form lease. The fact of the matter is, is that the bar form business lease has precisely 18B in the bar form business lease is precisely this provision. Okay, it is under the rubric of signs, and it in fact um, uh, basically says, at such time, meaning at the last 90 days. That um, uh, uh, that that's when uh, the tenant must shall permit or will permit access for purposes of. of Couldn't a, we a just look at that as an additional? That that's pretty much an explicit uh, right of access relating to signs and for sale signs and for rent signs. But uh, couldn't we look at the other one as being a very very specific non-exclusive right of occupancy as well? I don't understand the question, Your Honor. Well, this one. When we talk about 12A, all that does is gives you the definitions of signs, Correct. and then it has a very, very specific, explicit right of access, but isn't the same uh, explicit uh, right of access given under the quiet and non-exclusive right of enjoyment? No, because because it would it would seem to me that 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 there is that basically first of all just because parties disagree about um, uh, the, what a, me the, a meaning of a pr particular provision is doesn't mean it's ambiguous. And the fact of the matter is in this case, um, uh, 
again, I go back to the whole issue of what is the consequence of what you're talking about, which is to imply a right. Um, first of all, the, the contract is, the lease is silent, okay? Um, there are so many uh, principles of statutory, of, uh, I'm sorry, of, um, of contract interpretation that would be violated by the result um, that Alta Vista is, is um, advocating. Council, what about the rule that we construe ambiguities against the drafter? Does that help either side here? I don't think it does in this particular case because um, we're talking sophisticated business, business people. Um, and uh, again, I don't think that, that, that there is an ambiguity here because if, I think- If we found that there was an ambiguity in this cut scope, would summary judgment have to be reversed? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, I think that, um, uh, no, I don't believe that summary judgment in this case ought, should be reversed for this reason. The fact of the matter is, is that um, uh, Alta Vista had the ability and the, um, at the time of creating the summary judgment record, uh, it did not come forward with um, evidence um, of Extrin uh, reasonable extrinsic evidence that would show. And again, I go back to what you end up with if you imply that right. There may be, there's um, section, section 13 talks about assignment, section 19 talks about, uh, um, I'm sorry, about mortgaging. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that, is that there was no evidence on the record and there was every opportunity for Alta Vista to put evidence on the record of a of, of tr uh, a trade dealing, a trade well, practice. Another question, though, along the same lines is, what if you don't construe a limited right of access of some kind? Can you ordinarily sell commercial property, assign commercial property without some limited access by a potential um, buyer? And the same is true with the mortgage. I mean, ordinarily, before a bank lends significant funds on commercial property, either an appraisal or an inspection or some kind. I surely understand you don't want people you know, kind of right. interfering right. with the business and TIPA violations and all that, but, but if there is no zero right of access, as I, as I understand you'd argue, does that eviscerate the ability to sign and to get a mortgage? No, I think first of all, as I understand mortgaging, um, it's quite frequent. It's quite frequent uh, to basically take a bulk mortgage. In other words, to throw property in, and so there'd be no reason to 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 view it that at that time. Um, uh, and and in addition, and in addition, with regard to assignment, basically assignment generally means the assignment of a right to. Um, uh, to, to receive payments, correct? I mean, generally, so it would ordinarily not, in my mind, the idea of s assignment versus sale is different. And so um, uh, I think that you end up with basically, with this court ba uh, basically creating in the, in the um, uh, where there's silence, creating a new term in this agreement. Ms. Kutsko, you talked about rules of interpretation. Isn't one of the rules of interpretation that we try to construe or interpret contracts to, so that they lead to a reasonable or just result? Right. What, what, one thing we've not heard about at all is what, what's the harm to your client if the landlord brings this potential buyer onto the property so they can do an inspection? It seems to me it's just kind of a, maybe a holdup by your client um, I have, two com I have two comments yeah. to make about that. First, in, um, the fact of the matter is it is a medical practice. Um, since 2003, the, the concerns about, the concerns about um, uh, uh, confidentiality have become great. Um, even after hours, incidental disclosure of protected health information. And in fact, since we're uh, discussing we're discussing this, I've had other physician clients concerned about that particular issue. And then the, sh the short answer is that, that um, or the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, Dr. Maurer could do this under the lease. He believed that he had the right to do this under the lease, to limit it till the last 90 days, and, and he did. And I still submit 
that if this court either implies or it um, uh, uh, finds that there is a that there is a right of access at some other time, the court is is doing what Justice Apple said the court shouldn't do in his special concurrence in Kern, which is basically in, invent a term um, that doesn't exist in the contract. Uh, I'd be glad to answer. Can I ask one, one last question? Yeah. Um, does the 90-day uh, provision regarding signs, uh, is that in there because posting a for sale sign um, could have an um, effect of scaring off customers? Does that apply to a medical practice? Well, I think that, that, that um, uh, no, but there are other concerns, which is one, the confidentiality. The second one is it's not clear if walking into, if I walked into my optometrist's office, I'm not sure I'd want to see a for sale sign on the outside. I don't know what that would mean. And so I, I do think that that issue um, is a concern, con concern, even though it's a medical practice. Anything? Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Rebuttal. Um, I want to kind of finish on the point that I was um, addressing with Justice Zager, um, and it has to do with the the relationship between the parties and the interaction between the parties. Um, when Alta Vista purchased the property, and this is in the record, when Alta Vista purchased the property, I4 and I and Mauer Vision Center allowed them access to the property to view it for purposes of inspecting it for a purchase. Now, during the, we, we had a healthy exchange during the, the hearing on the motion for summary judgment, and Judge Stout and I did, and, and that was one of the issues that was raised. And, and Ms. Kutzko raised the point at that point in time that paragraph 17C states that if, uh, uh, if we're allowed access at one point, that doesn't mean that we're waiving it for, for all of time. And that was never the argument. Uh, that, that was never the argument that we were making. What we were, the argument we were making is that that is extrinsic evidence of what the parties understood the lease to be, what, what those, these provisions in the lease were. Um, and that was that the landlord was allowed access to show the property to a potential purchaser. Um, and, and Justice Wiggins, um, you, you brought up the point about, um, uh, you know, coming onto the property and, and the assignment and, and that it wouldn't necessarily always, um, uh, require a party to come on. And, and I think that's correct, that there are certainly assignments, like, like you indicated, that there are certainly assignments that can be made from one entity to another that are controlled by the same individuals. But, but the point is that there are also assignments that will require, such as a, a potential sale, that will require that a purchaser would come onto the property to inspect it, and if that purchaser had a lender, that that lender could come onto the property and conduct an appraisal or an inspection in order to consummate the transaction. And for that purpose, in order to effectuate the terms of the lease, that an implied right to access, uh, or a right to access should be necessarily implied into uh, the terms of the, the lease. And I also don't believe that the integration clause is, is relevant for purposes of our argument because the argument that, that Alta Vista is making is that the right of access is implied from the terms that are in the contract. We're not asking to add new terms to the contract, which then would trigger the integration clause. We're asking the court to interpret the, the um, provisions of the uh, contract to rely upon the cases uh, of this court, which state that um, uh, certain rights can be implied or obligations can be implied into the contract uh, other than just what is expressly stated in the contract. Um, so again, I, I don't believe that the integration clause is triggered based on uh, uh, the argument that you make. But the final point that I want to make, and, and Justice Mansfield, you, you raised this with um, Ms. Kutzko, is what is the harm here? What, my client reached out and tried to coordinate reasonable access so that they would not trigger um, con these concerns about com client confidentiality and, and business interruption. We were willing to go in the evening and at a time when representatives would be there so we weren't going through um, 
patient files and those sorts of things. My client didn't care about that stuff. They wanted to look at the structure of the building. Um, the, the potential purchaser wanted to look at the structure of the building, not go through patient files. There was no harm. It was going to be a minimal invasion. And I, I, this is the reason why we cited the, the Midwest management case, um, which discusses implied duty of good faith and reasonableness built into the interpretation of the, the lease. Um, because I think that good faith and fair dealing would require that, that um, it would have been a minimal invasion uh, on, on Maurer and that, that there are provisions here where the right to access um, can, can uh, certainly be implied. Um, so for these reasons, I think that uh, uh, the, the district court uh, did not correctly apply the law in, in that it did not interpret the contract as a whole. Um, it did not uh, necessarily imply terms that should have been necessarily implied, and it granted the motion for summary judgment when it shouldn't have been granted as a matter of law. So I thank you for your time. Thank you as well, Mr. Lorenzen. Uh, the case then is submitted, and the bailiff may adjourn court. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.